communicating uh, communications and actually arranging for the safety. So uh, no emotion during the run, there's no room for it. Speaker, Texas Mamana, clear to go. Okay, so we are actually on course for a world land speed record of 700 miles an hour. Now, do remember, what he's doing is he's not driving the car as fast as it'll go. He is driving to a Mach number. Now, the interesting thing about this is if the temperature goes up any further between now and the return run, he'll come back faster. Fuel, both tanks. Go just head on as I vent is closed for change. Okay, station call in position. Okay, Nick, in your own time, you clear to one plug, panel's on, chuck's away. Be lucky. Bye. This is C, ready to roll. SC clear, set this Mamana, clear to roll. 130. Engines are good. 200. One more left turn. The power card, 90, and ah, it's going to 650, 670. Subject to confirmation, and that's how it has to be, um, the, we have a new world record for the mile at 714.144 mph. <laughs> And a new world record for the kilometre at 713.990 MPH. Yeah. This as a team is our first great success. Now we're going to push on to the next stage, which is towards Mach 1. These guys have worked incredibly hard for the last three, four, five years to achieve this. And I'm absolutely delighted for all of them and for everybody at Sporters. They were over the first hurdle, but this was just the start of the race. We're here to break the, uh, the World Land Speed record supersonic for the first time ever. So we've got a long way to go yet. We only did 92, 93% of the speed of sound. But we're certainly getting there, and in the meantime, it's a great boost to confidence for the team that we've just set a World Land Speed record. It's great actually to be able to pass it on to your own team. I mean, that is just wonderful. And of course, to do it in such style, to have a situation where the new 714 mile an hour record is 80 miles an hour faster than my last one. I mean, that is the biggest jump in land speed record history. That's just a wonderful achievement. Because of the air temperature, thrust SSC needed to go at least another 40 miles per hour faster to break the sound barrier. But it was to be a dangerous journey into the unknown. The next morning, Andy and Jane arrived to check out the state of the car. Thrust had suffered damage to a body panel beneath the parachute tubes. It had been caused by the enormous force of air flowing under the car at high speed. To ensure that it would hold tight, the replacement panel was bonded and riveted into place. Now the car's been over 700, it's taken quite a pounding. Uh, aerodynamically and we want to check every single rivet yeah, and nut and weld just to find out what the effects are because nobody's ever done it before. Yeah. So it's a, it's a safety first, slowly, slowly, check as you go <laughs> approach. This was the big day. Four years of development and construction. Two years of testing. 54 runs so far, but it was still one step at a time. On his first run, Andy was under instructions to achieve a target speed of Mach 0.95. But 
that Andy experienced serious instability and the car kept veering off course. He aborted the run at 560 miles per hour. The next thing is for the design team to get up there quickly, check out what's happened and make the decision as to whether they're going to make another run in the next hour or so, or whether we're going to have to abandon for the morning or abandon for the day. It was a worrying moment for Noble. The team made adjustments to the tailplane and risked a second run. But within seconds, Andy had to abort again. Back at camp, the press wanted to know why. I don't know what's happened and why Andy shut it down. You'll appreciate that uh, testing any high-speed car, um, whether it be Indy cars or Formula One cars, uh, they take time to uh, check the trim of the car and literally tune it. Um, this is the stage that we're in at the moment. There's no textbook you can get the data from. We're writing the textbook. Is this an, an all-or-nothing effort? Well, I think that uh, what worries me is our ability to fund a return trip next year. That really worries me. Uh, we had enormous problems getting here in the first place. So if you don't do it this time around, do you think that's the end of it? Uh, it could well be, yes. The only option was to return to base. The sound barrier would have to wait for another day. As they investigated the problem, the weather turned against them. High winds swept across the mountains and whipped the desert into a gigantic sandstorm. The team had no option but to just sit and wait. It was just over 50 years ago that aircraft designers coined the phrase the sound barrier when they found that they experienced an enormous increase in drag as they approached supersonic speeds. Pilots experienced strange, disturbing effects. The controls would shudder violently, lock up, and even work in reverse. Sometimes with catastrophic results. Very little was understood about the effects of supersonic shockwaves when Chuck Yeager flew through the sound barrier in 1947. His Bell X-1 was carried into the stratosphere under the belly of a B-29 bomber. After the X-1 was launched, Yeager fired his rocket engines and accelerated towards Mach 1. He experienced some buffeting and instability, but he kept the control steady and made it through. Observers on the ground heard a sonic boom. Wind tunnel research revealed the reason for the buffeting and instability. When an aircraft travels faster than the speed of sound, air is compressed at the nose of the plane, and it spreads out into a cone-shaped shock wave. The solution was to keep the wings inside the cone. Swept back wings solved the problem. But even with the new designs, flying supersonic was still an incredibly dangerous gamble. At a British air show in 1952, John Derry was demonstrating breaking the sound barrier when disaster struck. Just as the sonic boom passed over the crowd, the fighter plane exploded in the air. Derry and 62 onlookers were killed as the aircraft smashed into the ground. Eventually, the problems of flying supersonic were solved. In 1967, Pete Knight not only went supersonic, but he flew at over six times the speed of sound. The airplanes are so well designed that uh, they slip through supersonic flight very easily. 
There is no buffeting or physical sensation. In fact, uh, the only way we know we're going supersonic is to look at the gauges. Pete Knight became the fastest man ever to fly in the Earth's atmosphere. Amazing flights like these have given aviators a much better understanding of how shockwaves behave. If you take a rowboat in a calm lake or a calm river and uh, row the boat very slowly, you'll see a bow wave start up in front of the boat. As you row a little bit faster, that bow wave attaches to the boat and then sends bow waves off to the shore. If you're standing on the shore, you'll feel that as it goes by you as the water comes up your leg and down. And that's the uh, analogy to a shock wave. As you're standing on the ground and the airplane goes supersonic, it drags a shock wave along with it. And when that shock wave passes you on the ground, it is an overpressure in the air. And you hear it as a bang because it's a quick overpressure. In the 1950s, the Air Force wanted to find out what would happen to a pilot if he had to eject at supersonic speed. They began research at this 10-mile-long sled track at Holloman Air Force Base. Dr. John Stepp was the willing volunteer. For the human experiments, this sled was used and uh, it'll hold 12 rockets. And the highest speed we got with the human was with nine rockets. And believe me, it's quite a jolt when the, all of them ignite simultaneously. I was a passive subject for an experiment, and there was nothing I could do except sit there until it happened, and then hope that I'd survive the experience. December 10th, 1954, Dr. Stapp was tied into a sled for the fastest ride ever experienced on land. He was launched down the track at 632 miles per hour. It's like jumping out of a window at 10th floor. You feel just completely helpless. As the sled hit the water break, he felt the impact of minus 43 Gs a force so powerful it burst the veins in his eyes. The permanent effect that I got and still have was retinal hemorrhages. I now have implant lenses in both eyes, but uh, I think we succeeded pretty well in showing that the man would survive. Not wanting to take any more risks with humans, they continued the experiments using chimpanzees. With a chimp strapped to the sled, they reached a peak speed of 920 miles per hour, well beyond the speed of sound. Using unmanned sleds, they continued to increase the speeds to test the performance of aerospace vehicles and missiles. In 1982, they pushed the limits even further. On a night test to avoid collision with any birds, the sled reached 6,122 miles per hour, eight times the speed of sound. If you want to think about what supersonic speed is, it means that we're going faster than the speed of sound. What carries sound in the air is that one air molecule bumps into another air molecule. And that speed is controlled by how far apart those air molecules actually are. So when we go faster than the speed of sound, we try to move those molecules faster than they can bump into the next molecule. And what happens is they all pile up, and that's what causes the shock. That shock comes off of a sled, for example, and will bounce off the rail and bounce off this girder. and will cause high pressure underneath the sled and will lift it off. That's why we, we use slippers to wrap around the rail to hold the, the sled in place. But for somebody who wants to run a car, 